Okay, folks, uh, back with the uh, permaculture video series. Today we're going to talk about swales, and really swales on a large scale. This is what I promised to do, is to take some very large earthwork concepts and then do a second episode where I bring them down to something you can do in a suburban backyard. So what we're going to talk about today is swales, and I've kind of covered this before, but I'm going to try to do a little bit better job for you today. And I've drawn the, uh, the pictures bigger because you've asked that, and I drew them before we started, so I'm only going to kind of add some stuff as we go, and that should... Uh, help with my uh, lack of artistic ability. This is a conventional swale and I, I've done something that I think a lot of people need to see to really get their head around what a swale is doing. This is our swale so we're coming down slope, water's flowing into the swale and once there's enough water we begin to have the swale fill up. Now remember this berm is loosely packed earth. It's just dug up and dropped and there's there's no compaction. This isn't designed to hold water. It's designed to slow water down. So the water is able to seep into the ground, seep into the berm. But this is the big thing I think people have a hard time getting in their head when they see this from the, the, the uh, this viewpoint. They see the swale is filling like this. See the red line? The red dashes are actually the slope continuing through. Water doesn't sit on an angle. Water sits level. So the water actually sits level in the swale so it appears to be higher in the front than the back where it's actually just sitting level or as level as I can draw it. Now why do we do this? What happens when this water accumulates in this swale? Water goes one way and one way only. Down. It can go down across, through, or straight down as it seeps into the earth. Water never goes up unless we have uh, some type of a pump or energy source or trees can get it to go up or a little bit of absorption can happen like it's going to happen here but that's it. Otherwise once water is in the soil and everything settles out and the water stops falling it begins to sink. So the first thing that happens is this water begins to seep into this swale. It becomes very, very hydrated until this swale, or I'm not sorry, not the swale, the swale's here, this mound. And this is again the earth was just taken out and dropped there loosely. So this becomes very, very uh, hydrated. And this is a good place for us to come in and plant plants and trees directly into our swale and down in front of it as well. And this will provide a lot of the irrigation they need. So we can plant. Uh, hardier trees, you know, back here, trees that maybe need a little bit less irrigation unless there's an uphill swale, because uh, the swale's not really going to help them very much because water goes down, not up. Now, over time, this water actually begins to flow through the earth because it's, it, once the capacity has reached a point where it's wet as it can be right here, that's what's going to happen. And we're going to get a sponging effect where this water will be suspended all the way down grade. If we did enough swelling, long enough or combinations of swales, eventually we can get the water kind of weeping out down here to just kind of seep out. Because what happens, and this is a hard concept for some people to grasp, but sooner or later, you know, and it might not be quite the same slope, you're going to reach an impermeable layer, something the water can't get through. And over years, honestly, this water will begin to build up to a point where it's basically completely hydrated like a sponge. And even when you go through a dry season, this, the, this water will never run out before another watershed event comes and refills the swale. And you can get into a, a situation where you need very little to no irrigation. Now, these systems often need some irrigation early on, especially in drier climates, until this sponge level can build up. But that's how a swale works, and that's why we do it. And the, the big thing to understand is it has to absolutely be on contour. I'm going to clean this sponge up a little bit to make it clear what I've got down here. The big question I get from people when I talk about swales, how does the water get out? What about when there's so much rain that, 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 that you can no longer be absorbed into the land, absorbed into, there has to be a discharge point. That's where our sill comes in. And I've, I've tried to draw it uh, in a way that will make sense for you. The important thing to look at first, the green line down here is the ditch line. So that's this, the ditch itself. This right here, we're looking front on at this berm. The blue line, it's like it's transparent and you can see it. This is the level of the water. 
behind the ditch. Now, this could be 50 yards long. It could be a kilometer long. It could be 100 feet. It can be any distance that you want. In general, though, we're digging our swales and we're doing it for tree growing systems, large scale, two meters wide. Call it two yards wide and about a meter deep. So that's a lot of water. Very inexpensive, very easy to put in. Uh, a typical track hoe, excavator, even a backhoe can do these very, very quickly without a lot of effort. Track hoes are usually better because the, the, instead of being on wheels, you're spread out against the tracks. They do less compaction. Again, this is not compacted. This is loose, friable soil. There's one place that we do compaction. That's at the sill. And this is a one meter long this way sill. Now, understand one meter is not a hard spec for it's always a meter. One meter is a minimum spec. In other words, it needs to be at least a meter. And then we can come and put a five to ten meter compaction. So we're five to, or five to ten meters, five to ten centimeters. So around an inch to three inches of compacted soil, dead level at the end. Now remember the ditch, this part runs from just before the uh, mound ends on this side to right to the edge of the sill here. So when this water comes up to the point where it's the height of this sill, right? So if our sill height it's just a little bit below the theoretical limit of the of the swale. That swale will only fill, and I'm making it bigger than it would be by scale, so you can see it. But then the swale would only fill to there. Because whatever the height of this sill is, is going to set the water height. Because once the water gets to the end, it's going to gently pour over and, and run down grade to the next feature, whatever it may be. Now people say, well, why doesn't this erode? Why doesn't it blow out? Again, this is not like a dam. This is not compacted. If you fill it up and you wait for a day without adding any more water, all the water will disappear. It'll go down into the soil. It's designed to not hold water. So that's, that's one reason because if you, if you pack this like a dam, then as the water is falling, you're going to get 100% discharge once you reach capacity. With that weeping, slowing, you got very, very pacified water. The next thing is you're only talking about that much, that much lower than the wall. So you have a lot of the moisture weeping through the uh, the mound and only you know absolute watershed events are going to really push a lot over the sill. The other thing we could do, if we're worried that we have a really large significant structure in our swale, this can be two meters. It can be three meters. You know, it can be as wide as we need it to be to accommodate uh, the water. But generally, a meter will work in most instances. And uh, we can also put a sill at our other end. That's often done as well. So, and if those two sills are the same height, they'll just charge at the same rate. If we decide we want to push water in one direction, we can just come and lay some sandbags along this sill, and all the water discharges on that side, or we can, we can switch it around like that. But this is how swales actually work. This is how the water gets out. This is how pacify the erosion uh, so that we, we don't have any problems. And if this, if this mound breaks right here, it's not like a dam. It's not like the whole thing goes gushing over. It's a very soft break. It's something you can bring a piece of equipment in, or even if it's a small break, you can bring a, a wheelbarrow and a shovel in and you can fix it. It's, it's nothing like a dam. Swales stop erosion. Swales don't cause erosion. And one really important thing to understand is when you have this water discharging over this sill, it's only a fraction of the water that was going to come down the grade anyway. Because most of the water is in there and down in there. And I think you can see that if we push enough water into the soil, if we go enough water into the soil, we can make sure that this stays hydrated for months at a time in between rainfall. So that's it. That's large scale earthwork swale. Again, try to get this in, get kind of in, in mind on the scale side here. Two meters wide, we're talking as wide as from the top of my head down to the floor, actually a little bit, uh, a little bit wider than me. And the depth we're looking at, you know, a meter. We're looking at so something about this big. So something you could drive a small tractor right down the middle of. Tomorrow I'll come back and I'll give you how you take this concept and put it in a suburban backyard.